my co-chair is not here yet. She's still having breakfast. And the other speakers are, half of them are here. So hopefully by the end of the session, or by the middle of the session, hopefully everybody will, will be here. Uh, I'd like to welcome our first keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Adil Bushnag. Uh, Dr. Adil, uh, this is not in the paper given to me. He is actually one of the key founders of uh, WASTA, of uh, Water Science and Technology Association, when it was established. He was one of the strong drivers behind it. So we'd like to thank him for that effort that he did. And uh, it has continued ever since. He's the chairman uh, of Moya Bushnag, and also the chairman of Bushnag Group, which, was, uh, which has several companies active in water, environment, and energy, uh, and energy-related technologies and services, headquartered in Jeddah. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There's too much, uh, I think, echo, right? Uh, I hope the sound will be clear. Uh, Dr. Bushnak was actively involved in the establishment of WASTA, as well as IDA, the International Desalination Association, and was uh, later elected his first Arab president for the period 1987 to 1989. He founded the Saudi Water and Power Forum and serves as its chairman. He also co-founded Sarajevo Business Forum and serves as the honorary council general of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Jeddah. In addition, he served as a director of uh, a Jeddah Ch Chamber of Commerce and Industry and co-founded many NGOs. He earned a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Michigan. I'd like to welcome Dr. Adil for the first keynote to speak today. Thank you. I wanted to speak about uh, sustainability of desalination, but then I changed my mind. I am going to speak in Arabic, the exception of this uh, presentation, because the message is not to the experts, like most of you, but really to the people using desalinated water, through the decision makers, which we missed today. Uh, but hopefully, that presentation can be on the internet, or somebody can benefit from it. And my purpose is for this next 25 minutes, will be most useful to everybody interested in desalination. And most of the GCC people or people living in GCC should be interested because we drink from the sea, and that's the title of the presentation. So <clears throat> allow me, I can answer questions in, uh, I will speak about, of course, solar uh, desalination. I'll speak about uh, issues of sustainability, but from the social perspective, not technical too much technical perspective. Why? لماذا الإحسان؟ لأنه نعتقد أنه أفضل طريق للوصول للاستدامة المائية هو الإحسان في المياه في استخدام المياه. وطبعاً لأنه التحلية هي مصدر أساسي لنا. نحن الآن معظم سكان الخليج يشربوا من البحر، لكن في خلال 30 سنة كل العرب أو معظم العرب حيشربوا من البحر. فإذا ما عندنا خيار آخر. إلا إن نحن نهتم بالتحلية وكيف نستطيع أن نحقق الإحسان فيها اللي هو تعني الاستدامة الشاملة للمجتمع والبيئة و... فحتكلم هذه هي العناصر إن شاء الله في خلال 20 دقيقة من ضمنها الإحسان في العلم والعمل أقصد بها نماذج أشوفها مناسبة في الإحسان نحتاج الإحسان للتحلية ليش؟ لأنه بيزداد اعتمادنا كما قلت ولضمان استمرار لأنه عندما ننظر النظرة الشمولية ليس النظرة الفنية الضيقة نبتدي نرسخ ثقافة المسؤولية عن المخلوقات الأخرى والمحاسبة محاسبة النفس قبل محاسبة الآخرين والتعاون وجودة العمل كل الأمور هذه اللي هي ضعيفة جدا في المجتمع العربي للأسف 
ولازم نغير ثقافة العمل والتعاون والإحسان ولأنه كمان أيضا تقنيات التحليل تساعدنا على إعادة استخدام كل قطرة مياه وهذا مصدر آخر غير البحر يعني يجب أن نطوره والآن ما زال هو في مرحلة تطوير هذا مجرد مستقبل الأسواق التحلية تدل على أنه اعتمادنا سيستمر و كل الدول العربية حتى مصر هتحتاج التحلية عاجلا أو آجلا مجرد النمو في الطلب على المياه طبعا شيء معروف وطبيعي ما يحتاج أن نتكلم عنه في العالم العربي لكن خلينا نبدأ بالإحسان في الحوكمة لأنه هذا تعني المسؤولين وكلنا مسؤولين في بيئة عملنا أنا سعيد أشوف كهرما وإن شاء الله مؤسسة التحلية تنتقل إلى الخصخصة وتعمل بمبدأ الكفاءة وليس بنظام وزارة المالية أقل سعر لبناء المحطة وبعدين طبعا بنصرف أضعاف أضعاف التكلفة عشان نحرق الوقود لإنتاج لتر الماء أو في مشاكل كفاءة مو بس كفاءة الطاقة أيضا التلوث في الجو وفي البحر إلى آخره في حقيقة بدنا نحاسب نفسنا ونقول الآن نبغى نغير طريقة العمل ما أن نروح نبني أرخص محطة في مر في مرحلة البناء بل يجب أن نبني أفضل كفاءة وأقل تكلفة على عمر المحطة هذه هي المعايير التي يجب أن تطبقها كل الجهات سواء هي تملكها حكومة مثل كهرماء ولا اللي بيطبقه في القطاع الخاص عندما يجيني زبون يبغى يشتري مني موية أنا كيف أستثمر ما أروح أبني أرخص محطة أبني أفضل محطة أقل تكلفة لإنتاج الماء موضوع تسعير البترول والغاز والطاقة حقيقة يجب 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 يعني ما عندنا خيار آخر لأنه إذا استمرينا في النهج الحالي سنشرب كل البترول حقنا في الخليج في خلال سنوات قليلة يعني في جيلنا نحن عشرين سنة وبالتالي حنبقى دولة مستوردة للنفط وليس دولة مصدرة للطاقة ومن هنا عملية التسعير حتى لو هو ما هو تسعير ينتهي إلى الفاتورة لكن يجب المسؤول يعرف تكلفة الوقود الذي يحرق وأنتم عارفين يعني كل متر مكعب يمكن يحتاج من لتر لخمسة لتر بترول فأنت تقدر تحسبها قديش البترول اللي أنت بتشربه كل يوم ولا تستهلكه كل يوم عشان تشرب هذا الماء عشان تبقى انت بتستهلك ثروة وطنك البديل اللي ممكن تبيعها بأكثر من 100 دولار للبرميل وانت مجانا عمليا هي مجانا فعملية استرجاع التكلفة شيء أساسي في الحوكمة وللأسف هذا ما هو موجود ولا في الآلية فنحن فجوة بيننا وبين الاستدامة والإحسان فجوة كبيرة وبتتنامى من ضمن مشكلة الاستدامة المالية لمصادر المياه أو لهذه محطات التحلية والمعالجة والخدمات المياه يجب أن ننتقل لما كانت عليه أجدادنا ومدننا الأوقاف المائية التي استمرت لأكثر من ألف عام في عدد من المدن العربية والمدن الإسلامية يجب أن نحي أوقاف المياه لأن المواطن لا يشعر بحرج أنه بيدفع للحكومة أو بيدفع لشركة هو بيدفع لوقف للمصلحة العامة عشان أولاده وأحفاده يحصلوا على خدمة أفضل وبيضمن الوقف هذا بيستمر بإشراف على مستوى المنطقة وهذا شيء آخر أيضا يجب أن لا نصر أنه تعرفة المياه تكون وحدة في الشرق وفي الغرب لأنه مستحيل تكلفة إنتاج الماء تختلف في كل مكان فإذا الوقف يحدد ناظر الوقف أمير المنطقة حاكم الولاية والمدينة هو الذي يحدد ما هو التعرفة وكيف سندفع للدولة وكيف سندفع للمشغل عشان نحقق الاستدامة إذا ما انتقلنا لهذا النموذج الإداري في الحوكمة نحن في وضع خطير جدا والأمن المائي سيكون أخطر من الأمن الغذائي الطاقة موضوع بالتأكيد إذا نتكلم على السستينابيليتي موضوع الانرجي مهم جدا طبعا المعدل هذا 4 على 40 كيلو وات اذا كان 40 كيلو وات اذا كان تتكلم على تقطير بدون انتاج مزدوج لكن اذا في انتاج مزدوج ينزل الى ال20 لكن برضه طاقه كثيره كما تشوف و 
في حين عندنا ربنا اعطانا الطاقه الشمسيه يعني معدل الان بالتقنيات الموجوده انا ما احتاج اكثر من 10 متر مربع عشان انتج احتياج الفرد المعدل الاستهلاك المياه والكفاءه بتزداد وحتتحسن وعندنا ما شاء الله المساحات في الدول العربيه ما هي مشكله فلما نجي نحسبها انه اذا كل العمليه كيف ننتقل من الوضع الحالي انه الوقود مجانا ونقدر نحرقه زي ما نبغى وباي كفاءه الى شيء مستدام مصدر طاقه مستدام ونبيع البترول عشان يكون في استدامه للتنميه عندنا وفي المجتمع والاقتصاد طبعا هذا نموذج كل المساحه اللي تحتاجها كيلو متر مربع انا ممكن انتج 60 مليون متر مكعب في السنه تحليه او 250 كيلو وات مليون كيلو وات كهرباء وكما ذكرت اتوقع اذا نحن طبعا استثمرنا مش بس نبتدي يجب ان نكون دوله ليس مستهلكه لهذه المنتجات بل تبيع هذه التقنيات لانه عندنا نحن السوق والشمس والقدره الماليه ان نحن نبني المجمعات والابحاث وللتطوير وللانتاج. اوضاع الاحسان للمجتمع حقيقه فرص العمل يعني ما اكثر العاطلين في السعوديه وفي كثير من الدول العربيه وسيزدادوا فاذا كل مجال كل عمل كل شخص مسؤول انه يولد فرص عمل للاخرين وهذه اهداف متواضعه وضعتها للثمانيه سنين الجايه ارجو انها تكون من ضمن ربما توصيات ولا يعني الفكره مش بس ان نخلق وظائف بل ندعم الاخرين الشباب انهم يخلقوا وظائف من خلال مشاريعهم واعمالهم عشان تكون في قاعده صناعيه انتاجيه اقتصاديه قويه تخدم قطاع التحليه ليس فقط بالمخترعات بل بالمنتجات موضوع توفير مخازن جوفيه بالقرب من محطات التحليه مهم جدا عشان الامن المائي لانه كلنا بدانا نشعر عندما توقف محطه لاي ظروف وممكن يعني حريق يوقف محطه وانت بدك اشهر الى اصلاح الموضوع ما بنتكلم على قطع في انبوب ولا شيء ممكن في خلال ايام فاذا يجب ان يكون هناك مخزون جوفي على الاقل 100 يوم والافضل يكون 200 يوم لتستطيع ان تحل المشكله والفكره مش بس خزن الماء هذا جوفي ما نتكلم على خزانات فوق الارض انا هذا مخزون استراتيجي لانه حيكون مخزون لمده ايام المخزون الاستراتيجي هو اللي يكون لمده اشهر وهذا لا يمكن ان يكون الا تحت الارض والحمد لله انه قطر بداوا ينظروا للاكوفر ستورج اند ريكفري ويجب كل الدول اللي تعتمد على التحليه تنظر في هذا الموضوع وكيف تفعل سوق خزن المياه يعني ممكن القطاع الخاص يستثمر إذا هناك من يشتري المخزون الإحسان للمخلوقات أو البيئة وهذا مهم طبعا لتخفيض الآثار للصحة العامة يعني أنا شخص متخصص ومهتم وبشتغل في مجال التحلية ما أعرف الدراسات اللي آخر دراسات بيئية حصلت في الخليج يمكن من عقد ولا عقدين من الزمن ولا أسمع أنه في دراسات بيئية جديدة على آثار على البيئه البحريه والمخلوقات الاخرى اللي طبعا بالتاكيد حتنتهي لنا علينا نحن على صحتنا وعلى الصحه العامه. فاذا نحتاج نفعل دراسات البيئه والصحه العامه واثر واثار التحليه على هذه المخلوقات المختلفه. الاحسان في العلم اللي نحن نحتاج نطبق طبعا الشراكه مشكله ال البحث العلمي في الخليج وفي العالم العربي تعاون ضعيف او مفقود يعني حتى على مستوى الدوله الواحده مراكز البحوث لا يوجد تعاون التقنيات الجديده تتطلب تعاون وشراكه من الصعب يكون مركز واحد خبير في كل الامور الطاقه والتحليه والاقتصاد والى اخره فاذا خاصه اذا بدنا ننتقل للطاقه الشمسيه يجب ان يكون تعاون لانه مش كل خبير تحليه حيكون خبير في الطاقه الشمسيه والعكس صحيح. فاذا موضوع العمل الجماعي مهم جدا ولذلك انا بشتغل وان شاء الله اجد من يساعدني منكم موضوع بوابه الابداع في التحليه تكون بوابه الكترونيه 
هدفها تساعد على العمل الجماعي والتعاون والشراكة لتطوير تقنيات التحليل و باقي طيب اذا انا انتقل بسرعه التقنيات الجديده الواعده معروفه الفورد اوسموسيز او ممبرين ديستليشن او فلويد فلويدايزد بيد ايفابريتر الابسوربشن كلها نعم ما زالت لكنها في مرحله تجريبيه وعلينا نحن الان نطبقها او نشجع ونحث على تطبيقها مستقبل تقنيات التحليل ترى واعدة جدا يعني اللي ما نعرف اللي نعرفه عن المياه اقل كثير مما لا نعرفه نحن لا زلنا لا نعرف شيء كثير هذه صوره لكيف جزيء الماء الماء بيتركب من صحيح هيدروجين واكسجين لكن هذه الذرات بتجتمع بشكل مختلف في ظروف مختلفه نحن لسه ما نفهم كيف تركيب الجزيء هذا هل في له 20 وحدة ولا ذرة ماء ولا 200 ذرة ماء وليش شكلها كده بالتأكيد هذا التركيبة بتأثر مش بس على متطلبات التحلية والطاقة وال لكن أهم شيء بتأثر على صحتنا على جسمنا لأنه تفاعل الخلايا جسمنا بالماء اللي بيدخل جسمنا يرتبط بهذا التركيبة لشكل الماء وجزيء الماء مش بأملاح اللي فيه وال حموضه والى اخره. بعدين موضوع اندماج تقنيات التحليه مع معالجه مياه الصرف برضه هذا شيء واعد جدا انه نحن نقدر نحل الاثنين بطاقه اقل. وبعدين مستقبلا الطاقه حيبقى مصدرها هو الهيدروجين. فالماء حيكون هو مصدر الطاقه اكثر من الشمس. كل هذه من الاشياء التي يجب ان نزرعها في جيلنا الابحاث عشان يستعدوا نكون رواد لما بعد ال 20 سنه القادمه. لانه هذا يمكن بده ابحاث اكثر من كذا. انا في الدقيقه انا ما اخذت ولا ولا 25 دقيقه لانه بدانا 10 دقائق متاخرين يعني. فعشان نكون انصاف واحسان للمتحدث. كيف؟ ها ترجمه سريعه، طيب يعني ممكن انا أريد أن أتكلم بالعربية وأحس الجميع يتكلموا بالعربية لأنه نحن هنا في مجتمع عربي الذي لا يتكلم العربية يجب أن هو الذي يعني يجد الحل ومستعد أجلس معاه نص ساعة بعد اللي يبغى يعرف إيش الموضوع بس أنا هنا أبغى أخذ وقتي عشان أعطي حقه يعني أنا ما أعطيت حقي في الوقت بتكلم عن نماذج في الإحسان في حلول شاملة لسه طموحة جدا ما زالت في البداية منها موضوع التحليه بالطاقه الشمسيه، مبادره مؤسسه التحليه، مبادره شركه المياه الوطنيه، وفي مبادرات اخرى. فنتكلم لانه ما فيش موضوع مبادره الملك عبد الله للتحليه بالطاقه الشمسيه ما تكلم عليها احد في المؤتمر، فاعتقد كما نرى يعني الهدف طموح جدا انه بتتكلم انه نحن آه نقدر ننتج الماء بتكلفه اقل من المعدل الحالي. وهذا خلال سنوات قليلة إن شاء الله وبعدين النظرة الشمولية الإحسان من ناحية أنه في مش بس فقط أبني محطة وأثبت أنه هذا الشيء التقنية متاحة بل أيضا أنتقل لما بعد كده بعد المحطة الأولى والمحطة الأولى ما هي محطة تجارب وأبحاث 30 ألف متر مكعب في اليوم ما هي بسيطة عشان تغذي مدينة الخفجي وبعد كده تضاعف فإذا النظرة الشمولية هذه مهمة والخطة الاستراتيجية لما يعني بعد وأيضا الشريك التقني لأنه نحن الآن ما نملك التقنية ويجب أن يكون معنا شريك تقني نتعلم منه فاختاروا آي بي أم عشان عندهم الرغبة يطوروا هذا النموذج كيف أنه تقنيات الماء والطاقة الشمسية ستدخل فيها شركات تانية غير جنرال إلكتريك وسيمنز ويعني بالتأكيد المهم فهم حيطوروا خلايا شمسية كفاءتها 1600 ضعف يعني تركز ضوء الشمس 1600 مرة عشان تنتج طاقة أكثر بمساحة أقل والتحلية أغشية جديدة في الموضوع وهذا بدأوا في إنتاج الخلايا الشمسية ومؤملين طبعا أنهم ينزلوا إلى أقل من 2 دولار للكيلو وات اللي هو هذا إنجاز كبير أكثر من إنجاز التحلية وموضوع المهم 
كمان في الاحسان ليش هو نموذج جيد في الاحسان انه مش فقط اني انا ابني ان اسس القاعده الصناعيه المحليه التي تستطيع ان تبني الكلام ده فاذا مش بس مهتم اثبت انه التقنيه والعلم موجود ايضا انا ابني القاعده الصناعيه التي تستطيع ان تنتج هذه الخلايا والاغشيه في حقيقه النموذج جيد النموذج الثاني في اللي انا اعتبره ايضا جيد كونه شركه المياه الوطنيه بتتعاون مع عده جهات سعوديه وعالميه لانشاء مركز تدريب لانه بناء الطاقات وتطوير القدرات البشريه يجب ان يكون من الاولويات وهذا المركز ان شاء الله يرى النور خلال سنوات قليله في جده ليكون مركز عربي اقليمي الهدف ليس فقط للسعوديين يعني من البدايه نحن بنصمم ونخطط ليستقطب هذا المركز الاخوان من كل المنطقه ويكون مركز ابحاث وتدريب فالمتدرب لا يشعر فقط انه هو جاي عشان يشغل محطه ولا يصلح مشكله موضوع مبادرة المؤسسة التحلية كنموذج آخر للتعاون على مستوى الوطني أو الإقليمي وبنجتمع عدة مرة يعني إلى الآن في السنة نجتمع مرتين للأسف العقبة هو النظام أو الآلية اللي موجودة الآن في نظام الدولة والجهات المختلفة في الجامعات لا تشجع على التعاون بالعكس بتشجع على العمل الفردي وما زلنا بنحارب لنكون جهود طبعا يعني بدات مجموعات عمل ومنها مثلا الخير بيجيب الخير انه مشروع وقفك هذا وقف المعرفه والابداع نبع من المبادره هذه والجهد لانه نحتاج الى اوقاف متخصصه تساعد على التعاون العلمي والمشترك. اخيرا مؤسسه التحليه عندها عده مبادرات واخرها التي اعلنت في مؤتمر العالم للمياه انه يعني الجميع يتعاون لتنزيل الطاقه 20% خلال الثلاث سنوات القادمه وهذا برضو ايضا شيء لانه الطموحات والاحسان لن يتم الا بالعمل الجماعي المشترك. هذه توصيه يعني ربما العمل منها انا حكتب توصيه اخرى اللي انا بقدمها للمؤتمر انه قطر تعمل مؤتمر تحليه عالمي أو تستضيف المؤتمر العالمي بيصير كل سنتين في دولة مختلفة ممكن قطر تكون هي المستضيفة للمؤتمر القادم اللي يركز فيه على موضوع الاستدامة والطاقة الشمسية والدمج بين التحلية والطاقة الشمسية طالما قطر مهتمة ومركزة وتبنت هذه الاستراتيجية وآخر شيء نتذكر الآية عشان كلنا نعمل بالمبادئ اللي تكلمنا عنها الإحسان في العلم في العمل في للمخلوقات الحوكمة لأنه حقيقة بدون ترسيخ الفكرة المسؤولية الجماعية ومسؤولية الفرد في كل شيء لن نستطيع أن نحل مشاكل المياه وانتهت في عشرين دقيقة Father Al Qayyimah, and uh, would you like to give us a very one minute brief uh, briefing of uh, uh, Dr. Adil? Uh, uh, brief? Well, I. Fikrat al Ahsan, excellence. And, and what uh, I talked about sustainability, but from, as you said, social macro perspective, which is uh, uh, how you do good, how you earn. benefit in the hereafter, not just in this life. So I'm trying to get the Arabs to feel the responsibility and to act responsible within their domain. They can do a lot, even in your just consumption of water, even if you are not expert and you are not uh, going to attend another uh, water conference or desalination conference, so just how much water you consume, you can do your part, your share, or, or you encourage somebody, your brother or your son, to, to be innovative in water or desalination especially, which has great potential. Whatever we know today and what we can do today is nothing compared to what we will know 
and we can do in uh, the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Maybe perhaps I should have introduced myself. My name is uh, Nader al bestaki I'm from University of Bahrain, uh, Dean of College of Engineering. And my colleague here is Dr. Uh, uh, Mahmoud uh, Abu Madi from the Qatar uh, uh, Electricity and Water Company. Now, the second uh, keynote speech uh, will be taken over by my colleague here to introduce. Okay. Our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Tangushi. He is an assistant general manager of water treatment and membrane technology department at Tori Industrial uh, in Japan. He took his master sp uh, scholarship in chemical engineering from University of Tokyo in 1991. Then he entered Tori Industry and he has been engaged in R&D of the membranes models and the water treatment technologies using membranes until 2004. During that period, he also studied the membrane modification for water treatment as a visitor and resinless uh, poly polytechnic institute for two years, from 2004 to 2007. He was chief process engineer especially for seawater desalination at water treatment system department. Now, he is managing the development of various membranes, MF, UF, NF, RO related processes for water treatment as seawater desalination, drinking water production and seawater treatment and reuse. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I am Masahide Taniuchi from uh, Tora Industries, Japan. Uh, today I will talk about uh, high performance RO membranes and the system for high concentration seawater desalination. Uh, um, at first, let me introduce the situation of water shortage and RO for seawater desalination. This slide shows a uh, world map uh, about the uh, present, uh, present situation of our water resources. The areas colored in red uh, are suffering uh, physical water scarcity, and uh, the color in pink is also approaching such a kind of scarcity. And uh, it's it difficult to find uh, uh, this orange area, the economically uh, problem they have. So global water shortage is a keenest issue, uh, and it is presumed to be even more serious. And this uh, indicates the uh, increase of world population and history of water treatment technologies. Uh, in the early days, uh, water was uh, pur uh, purified naturally, but after industrial revolution, it became difficult to secure the quantity and quality of water only by natural purification due to the rapid increase of uh, population like this. So, slow sand filtration followed by biological treatment and rapid sand filtration was applied and uh, in the uh, Middle East, thermal distillation was commercialized for seawater desalination. Uh, later in 1990s, membrane treatment became very popular uh, due to, uh, because uh, it enables uh, precise controls of water quality and high uh, speed treatment. And uh, this uh, kind of technologies are essential in this century. This slide uh, shows the type of the membranes and the separation targets. Usually, membranes are uh, uh, classified, uh, sorry, classified by four based on the separation target size. The smallest one is reverse osmosis, which can remove monovalent ions from the sol solvent. And uh, nanofiltration, which have uh, a little bit larger pore, can remove multivalent ions and uh, 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 natural organic matter. For ultrafiltration uh, membrane, uh, maybe you can find the small pores uh, by same image, and uh, it can remove uh, viruses and have a pores of a uh, range of 10 nanometer. The largest one is a microfiltration membrane, can have a sub-nanopores, uh, sorry, sub-micropores, 
and uh, can remove such as coliform bacteria, cryptosporidium, and so on. Today, we, I am going, uh, focusing about the uh, RO membrane, uh, about seawater desalination. This is a history of uh, RO research. Uh, the, the first concept of RO membrane was announced in the United States in 1953, and we totally started research and development in 1968 and commercialized mainly for ultra pure water production. In, after 1990s, RO membrane technology was expand, uh, has been expanding, especially for desalination use like this. So RO is an advanced technology to solve global water to, uh, shortage and uh, water pollution. Uh, as for the RO membrane, uh, there are a lot of shapes, uh, different uh, type of RO membrane, but the most popular one is a thin film composite flat sheet type membrane. This is a cross-sectional picture of the flat sheet membrane, and uh, it is, uh, consists of three layers. The first layer is RO layer, the functional layer, uh, made of cross-linked aromatic polyamide. The thickness is around 200 nanometers. And this membrane is supported by the polysulfur UF membrane and non-woven polyester fabric. This uh, flat sheet membrane is folded with a feed spacer, a feed and a permeate spacer, and uh, around the center tube, and like umbrella, and it is called a membrane element. This membrane element has a, a length of almost one meter, and many of the this uh, membrane element is uh, installed in the one cylindrical pressure vessel, as shown here, and uh, consist, uh, compose uh, membrane unit. This one member, uh, RO membrane unit can uh, produce, for example, uh, 5,000 cubic meter per day from, uh, of drinking water from seawater. Uh, by the way, uh, the surface of the membrane is like a fibril in the stomach, uh, to give, uh, get a larger surface area. This table is a large uh, seawater RO plants using our Torres membranes. Uh, remarkable uh, points are uh, almost all uh, large plants uh, were constructed in, in last 10 years, and the largest one uh, located in Algeria is uh, supposed to be uh, start op starting operation uh, this year, has a capacity of 500,000 cubic meter per day, which is almost same as a uh, thermal distillation plant. And uh, previously, seawater RO membrane uh, was uh, regarded as difficult to apply in the Middle East, especially in the Gulf area, uh, but uh, in, in the recent date, uh, these uh, highlighted ones are uh, located in the Middle East. A lot of uh, uh, seawater RO plants were constructed and, uh, uh, in operation. Uh, then let's uh, move on to the pilot trials in the, at the Gar Arabian Gulf. We, we, we conducted such a kind of trials to verify and in, in, in introduce the performance of our uh, seawater RO membranes. We will introduce uh, two, uh, two cases this time. Before uh, introduction, let me confirm the technological points of, for seawater RO at the Gar Arabian Gulf. The points are two. Uh, one is a semi-closed coastal sea area just open at the Holmes Strait, and uh, shallow open sea less than 200 meters. So as a result, uh, the seawater has an extremely high salinity, up to 60,000 60, milligrams per liter, and it, it means a large osmotic pressure required uh, for high pressure operation of RO. The second one is high temperature, up to 40 degrees. Product water quality is worse due to the salt uh, diffusivity increase at uh, such a high temperature. Also, life of the membrane might be spoiled uh, due to the loss of stiffness and the enhancement of the reaction, uh, actually degradation of the membrane. And the third one is high organic content. Uh, wastewater from 
these land area gives a nutrition and this shallow open sea uh, uh, allows sunshine helps to grow. So in, in, in such a severe area, our torres SWRO membrane uh, suitable for high pressure operation were verified. Then uh, let me introduce a first example. It was conducted in Tawila, UAE. The seawater temperature was uh, up to 38 degrees, uh, actually uh, at the inlet of the seawater arrow, uh, up to 40 degrees. And as for the TDS concentration, it was also high, 48, up to 48,000 milligram per liter. Here I show you the process flow and the DAF dissolved air flotation filter followed by polishing filter was applied as a pre-treatment. Uh, pre and seawater RO was followed by low pressure RO for volume removal. This is outlook of the pilot plant. This is DAF filter, and this is pressurized type polishing filter. And this uh, large one, white one is a seawater RO pressure vessel and the smaller ones are uh, low pressure arrow. This slide shows the specification. Uh, for the filter after DAF, uh, the combination of anthracite and silica sand was uh, applied as a filter media and filtered by gravity force. For polishing filter, a pressurized type was used and uh, fine, only fine silica sand was installed uh, as a Effective size was around 0.35 millimeter. And the filtration velocity was very high, uh, over 18 meter per hour. And for the SWRO unit, uh, our TM820A was used. Uh, this, type of, uh, this type is uh, very suitable for high pressure operation and can perform uh, high volume uh, removal and uh, followed by low pressure RO, four inch type TM710. This slide shows the result. The left figures are the normalized pressure, uh, normalized productivity and uh, red uh, dot uh, salt passage. You can see that, uh, that this is uh, uh, for the seawater RO and uh, low, uh, low pressure RO. Both of the uh, RO uh, could, uh, could be operated uh, quite stably. And these right figures uh, show the differential pressures between feed and concentrate, and it was also quite stable, and it is evidence of no fouling or no clogging occurred in the RO, uh, RO element. Then second example, which was conducted in Duhan, Qatar. Uh, it was a joint project with QEWC and Japanese members are showing here. And seawater uh, has a very uh, a, uh, high concentration, around uh, 58,000 milligram per liter, probably due to this closed area. The process uh, uh, screening sand filter was followed by ultra filtration unit as a free treatment and uh, for uh, seawater RO followed by low pressure RO as the same as before. Uh, as for the UF, uh, we used uh, our UF module, uh, the hollow fiber type uh, made of PVDF and, and manufactured by utilizing our new thermal induced phase separation spinning technology uh, developed by us. This membrane has uh, advantages such as high chemical resistance, high physical strength, high integrity, and uh, as a result, high filtration uh, operation was uh, possible. This is a specification. Uh, this slide shows a specification. And uh, for the sand filter, this is just for screening. So large size of anthracite was uh, uh, installed and uh, for the ultra filtration unit, eight modules were operated at the filtration flux uh, from 1.5 to 2 meter per day, which is very large uh, values for the ultra filtration unit. And uh, for the SWRO unit, TM820H, which is very suitable for high pressure operation, was used and followed by low pressure RO. 
This uh, figure shows a uh, SWRO operation without uh, normalized productivity, blue dot, and uh, salt rejection. And you can see that uh, uh, both performance was quite stable uh, during the operation for one year, including uh, uh, winter and summer. Then I'd like to talk about recent development of uh, innovative seawater RO membrane. At first, uh, here listed uh, technological requirements for seawater RO membrane. The first one is energy saving. This figure indicates the specific energy consumption for SWRO, and uh, in the last 40 years, it was uh, improved drastically, but still uh, less energy consumption is continuously required. Uh, so higher permeability to operate uh, at lower pressure is preferred for the RO membrane. And the second one is water quality issue. Uh, at the primary stage, salt rejection was the main target, but later, uh, such as boron, was regulated by WHO, and uh, the uh, ta technical target for RO membrane has been uh, for boron in the last 10, day, uh, 10 years. Uh, in Last year, uh, uh, boron, uh, boron guideline for drinking water was relaxed, but still it is necessary to reduce for irrigation use. Then uh, it is continuously uh, uh, preferred to get higher water quality, especially it, uh, in the Middle East due to the high saline and, uh, highly saline and hot sea water. The third one is the membrane toughness, such as physical stability and chemical stability uh, to reduce the operation cost, uh, actually replacement cost of the membrane. To achieve such a kind of re requirement, uh, we focus in such a uh, formation of the membrane. Uh, this uh, figure shows the energy saving performance and water quality and both quality should be uh, higher, uh, but it is necessary to raise the potential of the membrane. It is trade-off uh, relationship. So the uniform pore, molecular design for uniform pore for selective removal of a solute and thinner separation layer for e efficient transport of water is very important. Uh, 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 namely, a uh, gap between the polymer chain should be reduced and uh, like this and uh, the thickness should be smaller. But uh, if it is, uh, you should be careful, uh, this may spoil the toughness of the membrane. At the first stage of the investigation, uh, we found the structure uh, and uh, sub uh, nano uh, nanometer pore, uh, si uh, pore size distribution of seawater RO membrane was very, uh, were very uh, important and it was quantified by our Torres and our research group. And as a result, we became a first sub sub substantiator of a correlation between uh, boron, uh, boron rejection and pore size in the world. Uh, this figure shows the relationship between pore size and boron rejection. Uh, it is very well correlated, and it, it was uh, conducted by utilizing a PALS a pulse, a positron annihilation life time uh, spectroscopy. Also, TEM uh, transmission electron microscopy was uh, applied to get actual surf uh, surface area and thickness of the mem uh, function layer. Based on such information, we have succeeded to produce more uniform pores which enable to achieve both of productivity and rejection as shown here. In addition, uh, uh, chemical durability was also improved due to the uniformity of membrane structure. Then we also try to improve physical durability, mainly in focusing uh, uh, support layer. These uh, figures, uh, uh, the comparison results of our new membrane and other manufacturers' mem uh, commercialized membrane with similar TDS rejection and productivity. 
this table shows a measurementary result of uh, mechanical strength of support layer. Actually, our, uh, you, uh, our torres uh, membrane support layer has a better tensile strength, especially for cross direction. Also, permeate spacer was optimized uh, in focusing on the width of ditch. As a result, this is a cross-sectional view of the membrane, and our torres membrane was quite stable after uh, 9 megapascal, 38 degrees, uh, such a high, uh, severe uh, uh, conditions, it was uh, quite stable comparing with uh, co uh, other uh, manufacturer's membrane. This was conducted, okay. this was conduct conducted uh, uh, by the accumulation of Torres technology in fiber and textile. Uh, and, uh, actually, Torre is originally a uh, fiber, fiber company, and uh, the most of the uh, sales is uh, fiber, fiber and textiles. So we have such, a, such kind of technologies. Uh, this uh, is a trend of RON uh, membranes, and we, this, uh, based on the innovative technologies uh, as introduced now, we produced three uh, new, new membranes, uh, released three uh, new membranes. Uh, type R is a standard type, type K is uh, for high rejection, type L is high productivity. Then how, how we to use, how to choose uh, these uh, three membranes, we conducted a case studies of, of new seawater row membranes. And as a result, type K is very much suitable for high field salinity and high temperature. And on the other hand, type L is good for low temperature and low salinity. There I show, I show you the examples at 40 degrees and 45,000 milligram per liter of uh, field water. The product water salinity is very much lower and also lead element flux, which is very important to avoid the fouling uh, to keep uh, less than 30 LMH and it is also within the range. But it, uh, in case of type R, it is over. Also, uh, this uh, example is uh, around here, and uh, if we use uh, type L, we can operate uh, much less, uh, at, at a much less operating pressure. Then let me summarize. Uh, reverse osmosis is energy saving and en environmental friendly technology for seawater desalination, and now it is the most popular in the world. Two trials in UAE and Qatar demonstrated uh, excellent performance of seawater RO membranes, uh, type A and H, which could lead large seawater RO plants in the Gulf area. Then new innovative seawater RO membranes, type K, type R, and type L, were developed with the property of high productivity, high rejection, and high physical durability. And finally, our case study shows that the new TM820K is suitable for the de uh, desalination in the Gulf area. That's all of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Tang uh, Taniguchi for his uh, talk. Now our next speaker is going to be, I'm not sure if he's here because he didn't uh, show up earlier. Uh, suppo supposed to be Mr. Uh, Khalid Sayed, but uh, I think he's probably here. Alaikum <laughs> salam. Okay. And uh, he hasn't uh, given us any CV, so we'll ask him to give us just a one minute introduction about his background. Yeah. And about your body work and your degrees. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Khaled Al Said, laboratory manager at the chemical engineering program, Texas A&M University at Qatar, Qatar Foundation. Uh, I have graduated in qualified in chemical engineering in 2000, and since that time, I'm working for universities mainly at the chemical engineering departments. I'm specialized in uh, the field of environmental engineering in general and the desalination and water quality in particular. Thank you.
شوف السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. So our my presentation today will be mainly about inland desalination with zero liquid discharge. I'll be talking about the prospective challenges and the recent developments. I will just give at the beginning an overview. I will go to introduction. I will be talking about groundwater resources and the groundwater quality and the need for desalination for brackish groundwater. Then I will be talking a little bit about scaling and fouling and the effect on desalination process. Then we will be talking about the brine disposal from inland desalination plants and the different options available for such a desalination. Then we will be talking about inland desalination with zero liquid discharge, and then we will go for the conclusion. So, about groundwater in Min. Groundwater resources present most of the water available for the human use. Uh, some statistics talking about that the groundwater present almost 95% of the total fresh water available for human use. In general, groundwater has high quality. It means that low bacterial count, uh, low suspended solids. However, some of them are sever uh, severing from uh, increased salinity. Okay. That leads to the need for desalination process for practice groundwater. We used in the past just to use groundwater through wells or uh, artesian flow, just directly, okay, as the salinity at that time was acceptable. However, with time, this salinity increased. Uh, that led to the use of desalination. In case of desalination with brackish groundwater, we have a problem with the brine disposal and hence that lead to the need for zero liquid discharge for in such kind of inland desalination. In zero liquid discharge, we are trying to treat the concentrate somehow that there is no disposal of liquid waste. Mainly, it will be uh, converted into solid waste and recovered water. Talking about water resources, we see here that uh, in general, for water resources, we have the saline water, which is the water present in the oceans and seas, and saline brackish groundwater, which will have higher salinity, maybe up to 15,000. And then the salt water lakes. For fresh water, we have many uh, glaciers and snow covers, fresh groundwater and fresh lakes, and wetlands and river. So if we look here, we will find that almost 30% of the fresh water is a fresh groundwater. However, this 68.7, which is snow and ice caps, are not accessible for human use. As a result, groundwater mainly constitutes 95 percent of the water available for human use. Groundwater resources in the GCC. If we look at the groundwater resources in GCC, we'll find that groundwater constitutes the major source for water and more mainly for the agricultural development sector. If we have some countries like in Bahrain, we will find that for irrigation or for agricultural sector, it is 90%. For Qatar, it is 93%. For Saudi Arabia, it is even 93, 97%. Which represents a major part of the total. For Bahrain, it is 66. For Oman, it is 89. For Qatar, it is 50%. For Saudi Arabia, it is even higher, up to 90% of the total water withdrawal. So, as we said before, the groundwater quality suffering from increasing of the salinity. This is mainly due to different actions, different human activities, and mainly seawater intrusion, especially in the coastal areas. The other problem with groundwater is that groundwater will have mainly higher hardness when compared to surface water. It means higher calcium and the magnesium concentration. That's mainly because groundwater in the aquifer will be in direct contact with the aquifer rocks, which may, will be mainly limestone and dolomites. The good point with the groundwater is that there is no, the, the biological quality or the biological characteristic of groundwater is very high. Low bacterial count, low coliform, and all the other organisms are absent. Okay, however, the problem now that most of this groundwater has moderate to high salinity, which led to the 
use of desalination. As few examples for the depleting quality of groundwater, we have here two examples. One of them is in Kuwait. In Kuwait, 50% of the world's bounded water with salinity higher than 7,500 ppm. That was in 1989. However, in 1997, it was up to 75%. Later on, in 2002, it went up to 85% of these wells having the salinity higher than 7,500 ppm, which is much higher than the one compared for uh, the drinking water quality, which is supposed to be 500 ppm only. However, in Qatar, we will find that, as we said before, groundwater is mainly used for the agricultural development. We will find that in Qatar, there was more than almost 1,200 farm, registered farm in the country. However, 90, 950 only are present now. We lost this 250 mainly because of problems of groundwater quality problems. The increased salinity led to the, these farms run out of business. Mainly for brackish groundwater, reverse osmosis is the process of use, okay? Because of many reasons, because it can provide flexible solutions of different capacities. However, in case of sediment desalination, this is mainly for high capacity large plants like the one in Ras Abu Abud or different salinities. But when it comes to uh, small farms, all what they will need will be a desalination unit maybe with 50 cubic meter per day or 100 cubic meter per day. That will be more than enough for them. So this solution or this desalination technology can be provided only by reverse osmosis, not by thermal desalination. We'll find that for reverse osmosis essentially was developed for brackish groundwater. And later on, it has been uh, developed for seawater desalination. There is another problem with uh, constructing desalination plants for brackish groundwater. There are uh, a kind of uh, misconception that groundwater salinity is constant, that when we start the construction of the plant, we test the salinity of the groundwater that we have. OK, it is 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000. However, the thing that we don't care about uh, we don't pay attention to that this salinity increases with time. So for some of the farms, they have this designed the reverse osmosis unit with a recovery of around 80%, depending that the salinity of the brackish groundwater there is 5,000. After three years of operation, they found out that the salinity of the brackish groundwater has increased up to 10,000, which led to the decrease of the recovery down to 50% only. Uh, in some time, when the groundwater uh, just have a problems with hardness, the solution in this case will be nanofiltration, not reverse osmosis. Nanofiltration will be able to upgrade the quality of groundwater. When we look up to the desalination capacity, in the U.S. we will find that up to 51% of desalination capacity in the U.S. is for brackish groundwater. However, the global desalination capacity will be only 24% of brackish water and 56% for seawater. Okay, so what is what the main problem with desalination process? Usually it is a scaling. Scale formation or scaling of membranes or even in thermal desalination a scaling on heat transfer area. This is a phenomenon that takes place during desalination and the limit the recovery of the system that we have. This kind of deposition of foulants will reduce the productivity or the recovery of the system that we have unless we are increasing the energy input to overcome such kind of scale format. Fouling are divided into main four uh, types. Chemical fouling or scaling because, um, by salts or insoluble uh, inorganic salts or physical colloids by colloidal material or biological, by uh, uh, living organisms or living matter or organic fouling. So usually in a scaling and fouling in order to reduce minutes. the energy consumption and the cleaning time. Okay, I'll go directly to 
the most important points. For brine disposal from inland desalination, we have surface water or sewer system disposal to these kind of uh, water bodies or deep well injection or evaporation pump. However, for each one of these, we have pros and cons, different advantages and disadvantages, such as uh, like the salinity increase of the receiving body when we use surface water, uh, pollution of groundwater when, for deep well injection, water loss and high capital cost in case of evaporation. So the solution in this case will be mainly to provide zero liquid discharge for inland desalination, which will result in maximizing the water productivity or water recovery, preserving the natural resources, which is groundwater, producing byproduct salts, and easy of integrability and applicability. These are the kind, the different benefits that will result from providing inland desalination with zero liquid discharge. Mainly there is three schemes for zero liquid discharge. It is to apply thermal processes, however, this is a very energy incentive uh, process. Applying chemical treatment to the brine, making it suitable for further processing, or applying a special kind of desalination techniques, which is electrodialysis or electrodialysis reversal. Usually, the more uh, attention now is to, toward the intermediate chemical treatment. And I will show the scheme for this kind. So, in this case, the scheme that we have, the groundwater will be fed to the primary reversal sources unit as usual, producing product water and the brine that will be handled. The brine will be fed to a brine treatment unit where it will be treated chemically, removing most of the steel forming material and make the water suitable for further processing in secondary RO. Uh, mainly converting it to the chemistry of sodium chloride and recovering more water. Here are the results for some of the experiments performed at the chemical engineering department where we have provided intermediate chemical treatment process that was able to remove calcium, magnesium, silica, and sulfate from the brine treatment, converting the chemistry mostly to sodium chloride. We'll look at the figure. This is a picture of the pilot plant has been constructed to evaluate the success we have in the bench scale experiments. We have performed the, our experiments on two different groundwater sources here in Qatar, one with salinity up to 2,800 and the other one 3,600. We have a, the usual uh, recovery there is 70 to 75 percent. Our objective was salinity of less than 5,500 for drinking water purpose. We have achieved almost 90% removal for calcium and the magnesium, 75 to 85% removal of sulfate and silica, 20 to 30% reduction in salinity, and with overall system recovery up to 90 to 97%. These are the different uh, costs associated. We, under we understand that providing zero liquid discharge is added cost to our plant. However, with the strict environmental regulation that we have, we believe that zero liquid discharge will be the ultimate goal for inland desalination. In conclusion, groundwater will be uh, used as the main supply for water for a long time. However, desalination will be needed to have it with the quality suitable for different purposes we need. Uh, desalination will result in a brine stream which should be uh, properly managed. Zero liquid discharge will provide ultimate solution for the, the different problems associated with the brine disposal. At the end, I would like to acknowledge Qatar Science and Technology Park for funding and the continuous support for this work. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to remind uh, Mr. Khalid Sayed and Dr. Adil, we should know that we need maybe one or two lines summary or recommendation so that we can add it to the conference recommendations list. Uh, next speaker. Okay. Our next speaker is Mr. Anwar bin Amr. He received his master in mechanical engineering from Kuwait University. Currently, he's working in water and energy program in Kuwait Foundation for the advancement of sciences. KF. AS.
He has published several papers in uh, refereed journals, in addition to two published books as an author and co-author. His research interest includes modeling of thermal desalination processes and water plants and power plants. Please. Uh, the title of my presentation is Exergy Analysis of Large Multi-Effect Thermal Vapor Compression Desalination System. In this presentation, I will talk about the following outlines, an introduction followed by process description, thermal analysis of the system, system performance and model validity, sensitivity analysis, and conclusions. Several multi-effect thermal vapor compression desalination units have been installed recently in most of the GCC countries. The total installed capacity has increased up to 500 million imperial gallon per day in the last decade, as shown here in table one. It is clear from this table that the majority of these units were installed in the United Arab Emirates. On the other hand, the unit size capacities of these units were increased exponentially from one to 8.5 million imperial gallon per day in a very short period, as shown here in figure one. The unit size capacity is available now at 10 million imperial gallon per day, and it's expected to increase up to 15 in the near future. The new trend of combining multi-effect thermal vapor compression with conventional multi-effect unit led to this increase in the unit size. Limited studies were carried out multi-effect thermal vapor compression from exergy point of view since the mid of 90s, but it has been published in several works recently. So that a mathematical model of multi-effect thermal vapor compression is developed in this study using engineering equation solver software. This model is used to evaluate the system performance of some new commercial units having capacities of 2.4, 3.5, and 6.5 million imperial gallon per day. Figure two shows a schematic diagram of two identical and parallel multi-effect thermal vapor compression units combining with a single multi-effect unit. If we assume that the first effect is I in the thermal vapor compression unit, the next effect will be I plus one, and so on up to the last effect, J. Part of the vapor formed in the last effect is used as a heat source to the first effect in the conventional unit, which is J plus one. The system consists of number of evaporators, number of feed heaters, two thermocompressors, and end condenser. First and lows, First and second laws analysis are used to develop the math a mathematical model of the system so that mass, energy, and exergy balance is applied to the thermocompressors, evaporators, feed heaters, and end condensers. To simplify the analysis, the following assumptions are assumed in the process, steady state operation, negligible heat losses to the surrounding, equal temperature difference across the, the effects, as well as across the feed heaters, and the variations of specific heat capacity and the boiling point elevation with the temperature and salinity are negligible. Now, energy balance is applied to each evaporator in the thermal vapor compression unit in order to find the vapor formed in the first effect and the vapor formed in the second effect, and so on up to the last effect, J. Similarly, the energy balance is also applied to each evaporator in the conventional multi-effect unit in order to find the vapor formed in, in the J plus one effect and in the J plus two effect and so on up to the last effect N. Consequently, the total output, the total distant output from all effects is equal to the summation of all these as clear here in equation seven. Then an exergy balance is conducted to the thermocompressors, evaporators, condenser, and the living stream from the system to find the exergy destruction according to equation eight. Consequently, the exergy destruction can be determined in the thermocompressors, 
as shown here in equation nine, the exergy destruction can be also determined in the first effect, second effect, and so on up to the last effect. Uh, the exergy destruction in the condenser can be determined as well as in the leaving stream, as shown here in these equations. Uh, on the other hand, the heat transfer area of each effect can be obtained from the latent heat of condensation according to equation 17, so that the heat transfer area can be determined for the first effect, second effect, and so on up to the last effect. The system performance of this model can be evaluated in terms of gain output ratio, specific heat consumption, specific exergy destruction, specific heat transfer area, and specific exergy destruction. The validity of the model was tested. Again, it's some available data of commercial units having different capacities. For example, Alba in Bahrain with 2.54 million barrel gallon per day, and Omennar in United Arab Emirates with 3.5 million barrel gallon per day, and in Al Jubail in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with 6.5 million imperial gallon per day. The results showed good agreement, as shown here in table two. We can compare the model results against, against the actual results in terms of, for the three plans, in terms of operation and design parameters, as well as uh, in the system performance. A sensitivity analysis is carried out to investigate the system performance variation of algebraic units. This project belongs to Marafik company and it's currently co considered as the largest multi-effect thermal vapor compression plants in the world with a total installed capacity of 176 million imperial gallon per day. Figure three shows a schematic diagram of algebraic units. Figure four shows the effect of the motive steam on the distillate production from all the effects at delta T equal three degrees centigrade and top right temperature of 63 degrees centigrade. Figure five shows the effect of the top right temperature on the distillate production and gain ratio. Uh, the effect of top right temperature on the specific heat consumption and on the specific exergy consumptions is, shows, is shown here in figure six. Figure seven shows the effect of delta T on the specific heat transfer area at different two prime temperatures. Figure eight shows the effect of two prime temperature on the specific exergy suction for different unit capacities. Figure nine shows the main exergy suction in algebraic units. It is clear from this figure that the thermal compressors and the effects are the main sources of exergy destruction. The effects is responsible for about 64% of the total exergy destruction in the unit, while the thermal compressor is responsible for 20% of the total exergy destruction in the units. Figure 10 shows the exergy destruction distribution in the effects for the three units. It is clear that the first effect is responsible. Uh, first effect in algebraic unit is responsible for about 31 percent of the total exergy destruction in the effects, compared to 36 in Omennar and 40, 48 in Alba units. Figure 11 shows the, ingre the increase of the gain ratio in the new projects during the period from 2000. And five and 2010 in the GCC countries, while table three shows that the most of the multi-effect thermal vapor combustion units are operated with a combined cycle power plant, uh, mainly Omennar and Al Jubail and Al Fujera plants. Okay, a hybrid desalination system is introduced is introduced in Al Fujera projects uh, by combining large multi-effect units of 8.5 million imperial gallon per day with the reverse, reverse osmosis technologies.
Conclusions. The new trend of combining multi-effect thermal vapor compression units with a conventional multi-effect unit has been used lately in several, several large projects. This trend provides an approach to increase the unit capacity with a more compact design. Exergy analysis shows that the specific exergy destruction in ALBA unit is almost twice that in Omennar and Al-Jubail units because a high motive pressure steam is used in ALBA compared to a low motive pressure steam is in the other units. The analysis also indicates that the thermal compressors and the effects are the main sources of exergy destruction in, the three, in these units. Also, the first effect of Al-Jubail was found to be responsible for about 31 percent of the total exergy destruction compared to 48 in Alba and 36 in Omennar. The specific exergy destruction can be reduced by increasing the number of effects as well as at lower top prime temperatures. Uh, the manufacturer tried to increase the number of effects gradually from 4 to 6 to 8, etc., in order to increase the size of the units in a compact design. Most of the new units are commonly operated with large combined cycle power plant in order to reduce the power and water cost. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Anwar bin Amr, for this informative presentation. Okay, our uh, next speaker is going to be Dr. Mohammed Farooq. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Farooq has obtained his PhD in chemistry from the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, in Bombay, and has been active in the field of desalination research during the late 15, for the past 15 or 18 years, sorry. Presently, he is uh, a senior RO researcher at uh, SWCC, Soil and Water Desalination Research Institute at al Jubail. He has more than 35 publications in the field of membrane desalination and has presented several papers in the conference, in various conferences. His main research interests include NF, nanofiltration, and RO membranes, and CO2 pretreatment. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor Nader. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. I'll be talking on uh, lessons learned from evaluation of uh, different spiral bond seawater RO membranes in Gulf seawater. As you know that uh, water treatment process has been become a uh, viable option for production of portable water. And uh, previous speakers like uh, Mr. Taniguchi, as well as Mr. Khali that's talked about it. And we have something like uh, 77.4 million meter cube per day of production in 2011, including uh, the, the uh, contracted capacity. And uh, as far as the capacity of uh, the feed water type is concerned, the seawater forms a majority, almost 59% of the so, uh, desalinated water. And uh, over the years, thermal technology has been, has been uh, dominating the scene. And uh, especially the MS of multi-stage flash distillation in the Gulf region. And uh, recent development in membrane technology has uh, gained a tremendous uh, popularity for the seawater RO, RO desalination itself. And uh, RO now constituted in 2010 uh, almost 60 percent of the total uh, desalination technology wise. And uh, membrane desalination, as, as seen earlier, it removes salt from water by using semi permeable membrane. And uh, when you look at the RO capacity now, in to, between 1980 and 2010, the, the growth of RO, which can be seen on the green line. And major advantage is it's simple, cost effective, especially due to the reduction in energy because of the latest development in energy recovery devices, as well as membranes, low energy membranes available. It's modular and, and relatively requires more footprint compared to the thermal processes. This is a typical uh, diagram of seawater. You have an intake where you draw the water for the feed, then have a pretreatment, and followed by the high pressure pump system. We need to pressurize the feed water, and then send it to the RO membrane, 
where you get the product, and of course you have a reject. It is classified, the membrane is usually classified on, based on chemical composition you can, based on its configuration also. And uh, we have a cellulose-based membranes, which is hydrophilic in character, chlorine resistant, but they have a problem with easily hydrolyzed pure, pure chemical stability. But, but the latest technology, the most of the, the manufacturers, they go for polyamide by thin film composite, which uh, Mr. Tani, we just talked about it. I, I am not just skipping over this. And uh, this is a hollow fine fiber structure. And uh, very com com compared to the spiral bond and hollow fine fiber, these are the two basic technology used in membrane seawater RO. We have several manufacturers uh, of spiral bond membranes, film tech, hydronautics, Torre, Coke, geosmonic, Trisa, Boonjing, and, and so and so. And hollow fine fiber, initially the, the DuPont was one of the forerunners for the hollow fine fiber technology. They discontinued the production. And now only the manufacturer who's in the field is Toyobo, which manufactures cellulose acetate braised uh, seawater RO membrane. Of course, uh, when you have to select a membrane for uh, any plant, you need to have a sustainable performance of the membrane. It should have, the, in terms of this quantity, this product flow that matters, as well as the salt rejection, that's a product quality. And uh, of course, this even for an individual membrane, this performance depends on the feed water quality, the source water quality, it's have an effect on the membrane performance in terms of its concentration of dissolved salts as well as inherent membrane properties, its chemistry, the spacer, the feed spacer plays a role, membrane area uh, it plays a role. And of course, which we have a control over that is a flux, that's the number, you, you, unit water production per unit area of the membrane that we have a control over this, as well as recovery, how much water you recover from the source water. And when you talk about the Aljubail seawater water plant first commissioned during early 2000, and uh, we had uh, almost 15 trains. And 11 trains of it was hollow fine fiber membranes um, of, made of DuPont. And we had uh, four trains with spiral bone membrane. And then later on, uh, DuPont discontinued the production, so we had to look up for, for the, an alternative membranes. And uh, the spiral bone membranes performance in the Jubail was, the, the available was not satisfactory. And uh, we have, collected different membranes from the different manufacturer, five different spiral one membranes we choose, and to have a best option for the, especially for Jubei, one of the difficult waters there, especially that we have an intake, uh, which is a lagoon type, uh, which was basically made for the MSF, and later on they used it for RO, so we had uh, stagnation of water there, so it's one of the difficult water there. And we, during this evaluation, we learned a lot of lessons, so just I want to exchange the experience we gained from this evaluation. It was carried out on one of the working train, a train A namely, along with a spiral worm membrane or existing. And we isolated some of the pressure vessels and modified and accommodated these membranes, these five different membranes in that. And uh, we had an operator for more than one and a half years, 14, 000, almost 14,000 hours. And the SDI, the silt density index is one of the, the, the quality determining factor of the, uh, this thing is between 2.3 to 4.3. And the field water temperature, you know, the, from the winter, it goes to almost 14 to 15, and then the summer it reaches up to the 37 degrees Celsius. So we have a, a wide variation of the field temperature. And then uh, for, the, for the sake of, uh, as a stability policy, we don't rec uh, rec uh, recognize the name of the manufacturer. We have identified as like a membrane A, B, C, and D1 and D2. D, D1 and D2 are from the same manufacturer, but different properties. And each one has a, a different uh, active area, 370, 300 to 400 square feet, each membrane. I'm talking about one 8 by 40 inch membrane, standard membrane. And the, the, these are, these are the, the, the specifications applied by the manufacturer. And almost salt rejection, they almost claim between 96, 99.6 to 99.8. And uh, of, 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 uh, operating pressure is up to 82 bar, maximum temperature of 45. Of course, they are chlorine intolerant, so we are sensitive to chlorine. And maximum uh, feed water seeder, see SDA, it can take up to five. And this is, was the arrangement we made. It's all in a 
six, uh, five uh, in series, uh, and the five uh, parallel, and then we have uh, two membranes in a pressure vessel and three, three pressure vessels in series. And the major issue we faced uh, during the study was... Three minutes. Three minutes, huh? I just had eight minutes only now. Right, no? That's no, okay. Uh, I'll try to finish, finish up. So not to disturb the planned operation and production, lack of control over the operating condition because we are operating a part of the, uh, the main plan. So we need not to disturb, we should not disturb the planned operation. And then so, uh, when the, we, we could not uh, meet the maintenance requirements, especially when O-rings failed, leaks occurred, we had to wait till the next shutdown of the train, the, the schedule. So some membranes operated 6,000 hours, and some of them 12,000 hours also. And these are the results. I just, uh, this, like membrane A, you can see the gaps uh, where the shutdowns occurred. And this is on performance of membrane A. I'll just go over the quickly. And performance B, you can see that initially it was, uh, there was a gap there. And permeate recovery, the permeate conductive salts passage. And membrane C, a lot of gap is there because the, the membranes uh, need to isolate during its O-ring failures. So membrane C, membrane uh, D1, it has to uh, initial uh, operation and then it has to shut down for some period. And membrane D2. So I just get into the concluding remarks. Uh, we had the issue of lack of control over operating parameters for individual membranes because it was a part of a running uh, train. And maintenance work could, not, could be performed only during the train shutdown, so some operated 50% of the time compared to this. These factors made it very difficult for us to have a true comparison between the, the membrane performance. Uh, to offset the effect of the operating time and decline in performance, so that the decline in performance per year was calculated. We are assuming that the reduction in the performance is linear. So we assumed that. So we made a table out of it. And then uh, you can see the net operating pressure for each of the membrane, A to D1. And then uh, initial flux, initial and uh, normalized flow. And we have calculated a re reduction per year, 26. Some of them are 50 and uh, up to 51% reduction there. And then the flux varied from 11.2 to 16 uh, LMH. And then average cell passage, there are increase from 99 person per year to almost 275. And then delta P, one of the factors which, which have a, a, a tremendous increase in some case. And even the TDS, permeate quality comparison, you can see that some of had a very high TDS. And uh, of course, this increases during the summer months, the temperature goes up and the, the, temperature, this, the, go, uh, the TDS goes up. And uh, uh, we found that membrane C, D, and D2 had the best productivity, which is more than 30%. And salt passage also, they have better. C, D, and, two, and membrane A did show the, uh, A did show the very, uh, salt passage very close to this range. Membrane B was the worst. And similarly, in case, uh, the result of an increase in delta P, which is an indication of fouling resistance, we showed that membrane D1 was the best, followed by membrane D2. And A and C followed membrane D and D, D1 and D2. And membrane B was worst. And uh, although performance of membrane A was lower compared to C, D, C and D, it has shown better ability to maintain its performance throughout the test period. And this was mainly attributed to the low flux operation. It was average 12 LMH for this. So on the, uh, the, on B, D1 has a poor ability to maintain its performance because we were operating at a higher flux. And based on TDS, and the chloride content, the best uh, membranes which can be applied in a single stage are always membrane C followed by D1. And D2 and D have acceptable performance. But of course we need to consider uh, we had operated differently uh, time period. And uh, although it's difficult to make a pre precise accommodation due to limitations in the experiment setup, it could be said that C membrane C and D1 and D2 are superior in terms of productivity as well as salt passage. Any of these uh, membranes may be used as a replacement for the existing membrane, especially D1 due to had a thicker feed space, so the, the delta P was very stable. And uh, if you be able to operate at lower LMH, at 12 LMH, it may be 
you can sustain the performance. And uh, if a high, high flux operation is preferred, we need to have an efficient chemical cleaning. So we have to control the membrane, uh, select the membrane right uh, pro property, as well as operate it in the right uh, operation condition. So that's all. Thank you. And we have acknowledged to Mr. Abdul Khal Maghribi and Mr. Ibrahim Atik, who contributed to this uh, work. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farooq. Yes. I would like to uh, welcome our next speaker, Mr. Shrikant Bahat. He is from ABB India. If you can give uh, a brief about yourself within uh, one minute. Thanks for the introduction. Sorry, uh, Srikant is not the presenter. Myself is Sintil. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, I come from ABB India um, as a technology manager for Water Global Initiative. So today I'll be talking about a little bit on uh, ABB view on solar desalination. So what are the important aspects we need to consider when we are going to build a solar desalination technology? So, so uh, uh, overall my talk will be something like what is ABB and how ABB placed in water cycle, and then small introduction about solar desalination, and then the heart of the typical criteria we need to think and keep in mind while working on solar desalination, and then some remarks and conclusion, uh, how we can choose the better technology with respect to the different requirements from the end users. So when we talk about the ABB in water cycle, it starts from, let's say, waters. <clears throat> abstraction and monitoring and water management from the river and all the stuff. And then it comes that, okay, next level is water treatment after having the raw water, how can you treat the water? So, and then coming to the distribution network and the other side is uh, irrigation. So, so when we have a, a fresh water, then okay, we don't need a desalination. When we don't have fresh water, okay, we are going for desalination. So both fresh water and desalinated water coming into the grid. And then we are going for the two different one, irrigation and di distribution network. Then it goes through the industry water. So the industry water and the distribution network is going to release the wastewater. So this wastewater needs to be treated. So there are two different stuff. One is wastewater treatment and another one is industrial wastewater treatment. So then finally the water discharge and then coming to the all this stuff. So when we look the whole picture, what ABB does in the, all this sector, we provide the automation solution and also it starts from instrumentation, the sensors and it starts to the SCADA, PLCs, all those automation software. And then when it comes to the power side, we do provide the variable frequency drive, we do provide all the power products, we do provide the transformers, everything. So with this, I just would, I would like to uh, start the today's presentation, what is solar desalination and how this is going to help for future world. So the, the one of the coincidences is that wherever we found the water scarcity in this world, where God has given that the high DNA, it means that, okay, there is a future for the remove the water scarcity with the relevant information, which clearly shows that if you take a Middle East where there is a lot of water scarcity with respect to physical, when we say that the, <clears throat> the economic water scarcity, that is completely different pictures. When we say physical, so Middle East is more affected with physical water scarcity. And then if you look the DNA also, it's really a huge potential for the solar <clears throat> energy. So when we talk about the application side, there are two kind of applications we can foresee. One is the municipal sector, the other one is industrial sector. When we talk about the municipal, we have a two kind of applications. One is the rural side, the other one is the urban side. When I say the rural, capacity-wise, it's very small to medium. When I say the urban, it's really a huge capacity. So the industrial sector, mostly, <coughs> they are basically the wastewater treatment in mining, oil and gas, these are all the few expected applications which needs the solar application for desalination for getting a process water. 
Among these, uh, most of them are foreseeing that the municipal water uh, may lead the growth in solar desalination market. So industrial application for, let's say, depends upon the following scenarios. So one of these is the economics, how the economic is going to work for uh, industry applications. It should be cheaper and it's considering the other applications, reuse and uh, disposals, how that's going to be economically benefit. And then again, environmental regulations and social acceptance for using the solar desalination for treating the water. So coming to the market analysis, I mean, there's a huge market for both municipal and uh, industrial purpose. And uh, you can see that typically how many, what are the major technologies are occupying uh, in desalination when we remove the solar. So the thermal membrane hybrid, both membrane and thermal, and then you can see the, the, uh, there are a few other processes like the minor component like membrane distillation. <coughs> and there are hybrid technology like electrodialysis with membrane distillation, all those stuff. So typically with respect to capacity wise also, the small scale plants are relatively high and medium scale plants and large scale plants are relatively low. But uh, if you look the capacity wise, the medium, medium and small scales are serving for relatively equal amount of people which is going to serve for large amount of larger plants. And the geographical wise, you can see that the Middle East and uh, Asia is most leading the, the number of plants in the world. So coming to the challenges and importance of the niche technology need in solar desalination. So if you talk about the solar desalination, there are four components which we need to consider while uh, analyzing the technology for the future. So one is the efficiency, efficiency of the process. How the process is going to become uh, efficiency uh, with respect to given power coming from the solar source and how we are going to convert them into this uh, water or as a power. And then the robustness, the technology robustness, because we are talking about the solar desalination quite long time, you would say in 60s, but the technology, what we are talking about today, they're not robust, they're not, <coughs> I say, which can uh, work for longer life. And then the power and water. When I say the power and water here, how can we produce both power and water with the uh, same technology because both are highly interlinked. If you look at technology also, uh, some of the process they need both electricity and also the uh, steam. So this makes important consideration, okay, we need to have a both simultaneously. And then the third, last one, but least, I would say storage is important. Uh, let's say if you want to have go for only desalination, depends upon the need, depends upon the location, the storage may play a vital role. Uh, Typically, if we want to design a plant for the given capacity without storage, we need to design the solar desalination plant, which is two times the capacity so that we can meet the demand because you can operate the desalination plant only in eight hours in a day maximum. So with all these considerations, so what are the major factors we need to criteria which we need to consider when, when we are going for a new technology for solar desalinations? So some of the criteria like steady state performance, how the system is going to perform in steady state. And then the dynamic performance, and then the lifetime, how the system li lifetime reliability, availability, maintenance, and then overall cost, how the cost factor is going to affect the desalination process, so both capex and opex. So when we see the process, these are the most prominent technology which are uh, competing in the desalination, and these are the technology in solar side which are competing for combining these two technologies. And then when we talk about the uh, storage technology, these are the technologies which are available, which can be used immediately or maybe imme <laughs> with a little bit of more research. So when we apply all these criteria, so we need to have a, a technology which can integrate all these three technologies so that we can make a process which is reliable, stable, and which can be operated for 24 class seven, not even. <coughs> So when I talk about the steady state performance, what is the steady state performance we are looking for? So the, the capacity of the plant, so probably the capacity of the plant which has to solve the two sectors. When we say the two type of segments, urban and the rural segments. And then the geographical location of the <coughs> solar desalination system. When I say geographical location, there are so many factors which are affecting with respect to geographical location. Typically, the desalination plant which needs to be located near the seashore, but these factors are not favor of the uh, 
let's say the solar technologies which when you say when you say thermal and pv technology because the high humidity corrosion factor these are the enemies for solar technology so now we need to find how we can locate these two combination of the technology which can work together for longer life and stable and reliable manner so when i say the energy dispatchability here the steady stage how can i <clears throat> increase my energy dispatchability from the solar plant and how can I use more effective way all the energy coming from the solar technology to the desalination. So we can't use any waste heat from the solar technology which comes out to the desalination. So when it comes to the dynamic performance, so basically as we all know that sun is, the, the input comes from the sun is varying with respect to so many interference, external factors. So how can we adapt this external interference which are not controllable by human, <coughs> by human? So how can we adopt the technology which can also work with this interference so that you can achieve overall water and power production? And then the capability of, capacity, capability of the decentralization. So I was talking about in steady state performance, so the, as per the climatical and the technology requirements, sometimes these two technologies cannot be together because the desalination cannot be isolated from the coastal because you need to put a lot of energy if you want to isolate from the coastal to bring water back and then put back to the sea. The other side, you can't have a solar technology in, near the coastal because of high humidity and the corrosion factors. So how can you make this technology to, uh, to let's say, relatively longer distance and how can we make it work? So the capability of decentralization. And then utilization of waste heat it is one of the important factors. The waste heat is purely depends upon how the solar is operated. Sometimes you can operate the solar plant at full capacity, sometimes you cannot operate. So the waste heat availability is going to change in solar desalination. It's not like a conventional power plant where you get the constant quality of the, the waste heat so that you can use it in conventional process. So you have five minutes more. Yeah, I'm, I don't have much slides. <laughs> So then the lifetime, basically the ease of operation, reliability, availability, and the commercial maturity, how far the technology is proven in the market and how can we use it. And the scaling and fouling, this is one of the important factor, either you take a membrane or thermal technology, so that also needs to be considered, how far this technology is reliable, depends upon the high scaling and fouling feed water conditions. And then finally, this capex, how to minimize this capex considering the land cost, operating cost, all this stuff. So the steady state performance, this is all I already discussed. When I say the capacity of the plant, it needs to serve both the community, both high capacity and also for small capacity. So the some of the guidelines here, if you talk about the, the, the bigger capacity, the multi-stage, multi-effect, uh, with or without thermal vapor compression, the reverse osmosis and electrodialysis combinations can work more favorably for higher capacities. And with respect to geographical locations, the factors which are affecting the corrosion, humidity, DNI, cost of land, that will decide mostly, okay, do we need this plant at that location or do we need some other technology? And then the energy dispatchability, which I spoke very well, so the CSP will have more favor uh, because of storage options, where CSP allows to storage through the thermal, but the, the PV doesn't allow us storage through the uh, <clears throat> thermal technologies. And then when I talk about the dynamic performance, the adaptability to the dynamic performance. <clears throat> so more or less, if you see, the more dynamics PV can accommodate because even if cloudy season, the PV can operate much better way. But if you have uh, small changes in the, uh, the climatical conditions, then probably CSV is much better when you have high DNI. So these are the external factors which decides the technology. We don't have a choice, the major factors which we need to consider. And then, the, as I said, the capa capability of the decentralization, basically, when you have uh, <coughs> corrosion, all this factor, the PV allows to decentralization because existing grid facilities, you can decentralize these two, and that allows to that. Then utilization of waste heat, probably the thermal technology that allows to use the, the utilization of waste heat comes out from the, the thermal technology. And then the lifetime and cost, of course, it's very important, and this needs to be handled carefully, but this capex and opex it depends upon how you are weighting your uh, importance. Like, do you want to have a reliable system, or do you want to have a less reliable line? These are the factors which decide. So the optimal selection of the desalination under solar technology may lead to compromise on some components, and given by weight parameters to achieve the final <coughs> goal. So the overall, uh, I would say the uh, 
the industrial applications, it is purely depends upon how the water quality is coming in and how the economics of the process and <clears throat> the quality of the water majorly decides the need of the solar desalinations. And uh, finally, the conclusion is that the selection of the optimal solar desalinations with storage technology company will require evaluation of each criteria which is described before, as well as the alignment of suitable weight for each of them. This weight is normally comes from the region. It depends upon the region, this weight can ch be changed. So it is not that the one technology which is going to lead the whole world. That's not going, that, that, that cannot be done. One technology can be lead. So we need to adopt with respect to region, with respect to the, the climate that needs to be, the different technology needs to be adopted to work well in this. And the weight assigned to the each criterion, that's what I said, is governed by the priorities, decision maker, as well as the external factor influencing, such as local grid pricing, land pricing, environmental regulation, local laws, etc. So the one technology cannot lead the whole solar desalination, so we may need the combination of the technology which can solve the region wise. So that's the, the overall the conclusion which I have. There are a few other points with respect to the individual technology. When I say PV, CSP, which is going to be more favorable with respect to region. So this is the overall summary of both the stock. Thank you, Mr. Dan, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Mr. Nasser bin Salah. I hope he's around because, yeah? And I can please also give a small introduction about yourself. And I'd like to remind Mr. Bhat as Shrikant. We need a little, uh, couple of lines, recommendations, okay? Uh, from uh, uh, assistant resource scientist at uh, Texas A&M University at Qatar. Uh, I obtained my uh, PhD in 2002 from University of Monastir in Tunisia. And uh, uh, my research interests cover uh, the fields of water treatment by chemical and electrochemical technologies. As you can see here, my presentation will deal with, uh, does not deal with uh, desalination, but it will focus on the disinfection, which is a a, an essential step in the water treatment with desalination or with other processes. So uh, my presentation deals with the electrochemical inactivation of Legionella using boron doped dye. First, I will start by uh, a general introduction on the bacterial uh, water burn pathogens uh, with a focus on Legionella. And then I will give you an idea about the electrochemical disinfections. And uh, I will present, uh, then I will present the results of the inactivation of uh, Legionella using boron doped diamond anodes and I will, I will end by a conclusion. Uh, water contamination uh, is a major cause for uh, water burn diseases and seriously uh, threaten the uh, human health. There are three main types of microorganisms in drinking water, which is uh, bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. They can exist naturally or they can uh, be formed during contamination from human or animal waste. Some of them are capable to cause illness for human. For that, it is necessary to monitor the presence of these kind of microorganisms in, in water. And the microbiological quality of water is determined 
by testing for E. coli uh, microorganisms. The main goal of drinking water treatment is to remove or kill these microorganisms to reduce the risk of illness. Legionella, it is different than the other microorganisms, waterborne pathogens, because it is naturally, it can occur naturally in water envir environment, like sur surface water or other kind of water. They are able to survive under varied conditions, including temperature from zero to 63 Celsius degree, degree and the pH range from five to 8.5. They can cause two different uh, illness, lichionaries and the Pontiac fever. The systems that generate aerosols, such as cooling towers, baths, and shower heats, are the more commonly implicated as a source of infection with, uh, with Legionella. The problem that once Legionella becomes established in water system, it is impossible to remove it. So it is necessary to control their, its presence in water, and especially we can use, generally we use chlorination, chlorine dioxide, ozonation, ultraviolet, light irradiation, and copper silver ionization. These techniques suffer from Two things, they can produce disinfection byproducts which are carcinogenic for human, and also uh, this legionella can be resistant for long-term treatment. One of the technologies that we uh, use it in our lab to treat this kind of bacteria is the electrochemical treatment. What's this electrochemical treatment for disinfecting water. First, what can happen inside an electrochemical cell during an electrolysis of a wastewater? If we apply a current to uh, wastewater, different rea electrochemical reactions can happen. Uh, uh, at the anode, there is two kinds of uh, reactions, which, is the, which are the electro-oxidation of reductant and the electrodissolution of uh, uh, anode material. On the cathodic uh, compartment, we can uh, find the electroreduction of oxidant and the electrodeposition of material on the uh, uh, cathode surface. We, uh, uh, during the, electrochemic, the electrochemical disinfection, we'll use a technology which is called the which is based on the electrochemical oxidation of a pollutant. The electrochemical oxidation of the po pollutant can happen with three different mechanisms. The direct electrolysis, that means the pollutant can be oxidized directly on the surface of the anode. The second one is to produce hydroxy radicals and that they can be used for, uh, to uh, uh, mineralize the pollutants. The third mechanism is the chemical oxidation based on the production of, oxi hard of strong oxidant on the surface of the anode. Here I give you the example of perphosphate that can, be, that can react with pollutant in water and, form, and uh, transform them to uh, carbon dioxide or other uh, species. Two different kinds of electrodes we can find in the industry, what we call the active electrodes, such as the platinum, the stainless steel, and the dimensionally stable anodes. The second one is the non-active electrodes, such as the titanium uh, tin oxide, and titanium lead oxide, and bor especially boron doped diamond, which is used in our experiment. Here I give you uh, the, the difference between the two uh, electrodes in the, in the reaction with the uh, pollutants. And you can see here, the difference is that the, unfortunately I don't have, 
So the, the difference is that the hydroxy radicals formed from the discharge of water in the first step uh, are um, weakly absorbed on non-active electrodes, but they are uh, strongly uh, absorbed in the active electrodes. So in our experiment, we will use the uh, non-active, one of the non-active electrodes, which is the boron dopa diamond, because they can produce hydroxy radicals that can be used for the inactivation of uh, uh, bacteria. The main uh, problems of these non-active electrodes, especially the boron dopa diamond, is the uh, cost. It has a large price, 6,000 euros per uh, meter square. And the problem of other, the others is the dissolution of toxic species, such as the lead. The other kind that can happen in, during electrolysis is the indirect electrochemical oxidation process, in which if we apply a current to uh, an electrode, we can form electroactive species, such as radical species, that can react with the pollut pollutants to produce uh, the products in two ways, uh, uh, with reversible uh, oxidant to form a reversible oxidant or to form a reversible oxidant, what we call the killer. In our experiment, we used the electrochlorination because the chloride salts are frequently present in the industrial wastewater. So we can use them to produce the chlorine. And this chlorine, uh, the chlorine speciation depends on the pH. So if we use pH higher than, uh, lower than seven, we'll use the hypochlorous acid. Or for pH higher than seven, hypochlorite can be used. Our application to inactivate the Legionella using boron dipper diamond used the, uh, this uh, experimental setup in which single compartment electrochemical flow cell is used with diamond uh, material as anode and stainless steel as cathode. The electrolyte is stored on a glass container. To analyze the uh, bacteria, we used two uh, techniques the bacterial fluorescence and the colony forming uh, method. Here I show you the, the results of the production of oxidant on boron dopa diamond. And you can see here that <coughs> the change of oxidant concentration with time has the same profile. Uh, the absorbed maxima for oxidant concentration may be due to the stability of the oxidant and the mass transfer control. We tested this method for the uh, inactivation of Legionella. And here I show you in this slide the influence of current density on the removal of uh, Legionella. You can see here that the increase of current density to 100 mile, million per part centimeter square achieves a complete inactivation of this bacteria. We also studied the influence of sodium chloride concentration, and we find that the increase of sodium chloride concentration enhance the bacterial, bactericidal efficiency. Also, we studied the influence of bacterial density, and uh, we find that complete bacterial death was obtained for the different uh, densities, uh, cell densities used. Also, we studied the influence of the flow rate, and you can see here that the increase of flow rate decreased the removal of the, this bacteria. In a conclusion, laboratory experiments have demonstrated that galvanostatic electrolysis using boron dopa diamond was capable to completely inactivate Legionella bacteria in optimized conditions. The electrochemical disinfection efficiency depends on the dose of oxidant produced by the electrochemical oxidation of the electrolyte and the stability of this oxidant with contact time. The strong action of BDD can be attributed to surface and bulk processes. At the electrode solution interface, high amounts of hydroxy radicals 
can be produced, and on the bulk of the solution, the disinfection can be attributed to the electrogenerated oxidants such as chlorine. Further research will be done in order to obtain more information about the kinetic model to uh, develop field uh, conditions. Uh, before I finish, I have to acknowledge Dr. Abdul Wahab and uh, Mr. Khalid Mansouri for their uh, collaboration and the uh, QNRF for the uh, financial support of this work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, please also prepare a couple of lines of uh, recommendations for us. Uh, no. I would like to invite uh, our last speaker of this session, Mr. Khaled Yahya Abed. Please introduce yourself. It's working. Okay. alaikum. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Uh, I am Dr. Khaled Yahya Abid, a PhD in water chemistry, and I work for Kahrama for a certain while for disinfection and desalination water, exactly. Our lecture today is a chlorine dioxide disinfection system for desalinated water in Qatar. In fact, due to scarcity of water and the more needing of water, shortage of water in Qatar and in GCC countries, uh, we are using uh, desalination water and particularly uh, uh, the disinfection of chlorine. Uh, we have shifted recently, two years ago, for another uh, disinfection system, which it is chlorine dioxide. For to get safe drinking water, we have three major factors. Uh, to be uh, uh, concentrated on. Number one is protecting source water from contamination. Number two is uh, good treating for raw water. Number three is to ensure the good distribution of treated water to the uh, consumers. The chemical preparation of the new disinfection is uh, we have many methods of preparation and getting the new disinfection uh, chlorine dioxide. But the most important to chemical preparation is uh, when you're treating uh, sodium chloride with the chlorine, you get uh, uh, sodium chloride and chlorine dioxide. The other alternative is by treating the sodium chloride uh, with hydrochloric acid to get more concentration of chlorine dioxide and more pure as well. Chlorine dioxide in water. Chlorine dioxide in water, it has got uh, byproducts. One of the major byproducts is the chloride. Uh, it's uh, almost a derivative of sodium, actually. Uh, chloride, chlorate, and chloride. 
Chloride is about 50 to 70 percent of the uh, byproducts. Why chlorine dioxide disinfection is better? Why we have shifted from chlorine to chlorine dioxide? We have many uh, factors why or reasons to why we change from chlorine to chlorine dioxide. Number one, it's stable during the distribution pipes comparing to chloride. Number two, to chlorine, sorry. Number two is, uh, uh, is the measure uh, of chlorine dioxide and its pipe products is more easily than uh, chlorine. Number three, it's been uh, approved by EPA as a primary uh, disinfection. And even now, they are getting more expanded in uh, many countries, even in the United States of America. Uh, chlorine dioxide can be fed anywhere in the water system, in the distribution system. If it is hot water, cold water, reservoir, wherever you like, it depends on the desire. Generator of chlorine dioxide is very easily, easily two chambers of two materials, they mix to each other and uh, inside the water it gives the required disinfection. Also, uh, it gives more control of odor and test uh, comparing to chlorine, uh, uh, chlorine dioxide is much better than and there are so many details about that uh, during the theoretical paper, if you'd like to uh, go through. The typical uh, uh, for, for chlorine dioxide pre-oxidation is uh, 0.2 to 0.8 milligram per liter. Also, it is superior to control some bacteria as we are going to see in a table later on. Uh, Legionella or Cryptosporodium uh, as well. Also, chlorine dioxide is five times, they suppose, is more uh, better in activation uh, CT values for uh, Giardia and Cryptosporodium. We have seen here the uh, CT values for, and we can see for bacteria, uh, the lower value is the better. Chlorine dioxide comparing to chlorine is much better uh, comparing to chlorine and hypochlorite system. It's effective over uh, a wide range of pH, it works over a wide range of pH, while chlorine is very limited uh, uh, on treating the water or disinfection of water, it's only for uh, chlorine about 7.5 to 8, uh, while chlorine dioxide, it works for a broad range. Also, chlorine dioxide is less corrosive than chlorine. And the most important point is Chlorine dioxide, uh, the oxidation reduction potential, this could be the most important point for the whole subject, is the oxidation reduction potential or the capability of oxidation is much less than oxygen. As you see, OPR for chlorine is 1.36 uh, volt, while for chlorine dioxide is only 0.95. What it means that? It means the capability or the capacity to kill the germs, to treat the water is much, much, much better than chlorine itself. Uh, also, as I say to you, what's disinfection? Disinfection is oxidation process. In pure chemistry, oxidation is disinfection and disinfection is oxidation process. Formation of a chloride byproduct 
is under the WHO uh, 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 guideline is about 0.7 milligram per liter. Also for chloride, the second uh, byproduct is 0.7 uh, milligram per liter. Chlorine dioxide doesn't oxidize bromide. It means there is no bromide, the risky bromide uh, in the water we we'll get in the, after treating the water. Always we get the bromide uh, problem and risky bromide from chlorine uh, disinfection treatment. While with the chlorine dioxide, we get not uh, uh, any bromide, and we are going to see a table later on. Also, it doesn't form THM, with, which we use to get it in, in, uh, uh, with the chlorine in treating water with the chlorine, which it is trihalomethane, such as chloroform, bromoform, and so on. We don't get it in with uh, chlorine dioxide. Uh, also, it's oxidized iron, manganese, and sulfides. Here we are going to see the oxidation capacity of the most well-known and uh, used disinfectants in the Gulf area or in the most of the world. For a chlorine, for example, is uh, 100. For chlor chlorate is 157. For hypochlorate is 93. While for chlorine dioxide is 263 is the most uh, 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 value or the most oxidation capacity in comparing to these uh, disinfectants. It means the capability of killing germs and giving the pure water is much more, much, much more than uh, the chlorine derivatives uh, in general. We have some uh, controlling uh, measurements to, for chloride, uh, the most uh, important byproducts with, that comes with the chlorine dioxide. Number one, by controlling chlorine dioxide generator. If you control it by precise operation, uh, uh, pay for, uh, proper maintenance, by using uh, new technology, you can control the chloride. Number two, Using uh, granulated uh, activated charcoal or carbon, uh, you could control the uh, uh, chloride in general by adsorption or by sort of chemical reduction. It will reduce generally the uh, chloride. Ferrous also can uh, reduce the chloride. Uh, about 3.5 to 4 milligram per liter, it will reduce the chloride uh, uh, very much, very much effective. Also, sulfur uh, reducing agents, thiosulfate, metabisulfate, and sulfide could also reduce effectively the uh, chloride. Three minutes, Dr. Khalid. But as any chemical material, it has got advantages and disadvantages. Now, what is the disadvantages of chlorine dioxide? I'm not doing a propaganda for chlorine dioxide, but I'm showing you the true science of chlorine dioxide. What is the disadvantages now of chlorine dioxide? Number one, uh, the byproducts of chlorine dioxide, it gives the chloride and the chlorate, which it's limit the dosage of chlorine dioxide. Number two, uh, the disinfection efficiency of chlorine dioxide is reduced significantly at low temperature. At low temperature, the chlorine dioxide is not very effective. And I'm going to tell you something, some information may be out of this uh, paper. For example, in the United States of America now, uh, they are applying the chlorine dioxide and expanding in the chlorine dioxide disinfection uh, experiment. Now they find the uh, 
cold areas of the north of America, the uh, chlorine dioxide disinfection is less effective than the south. When they go back to many factors, they found the temperature, the high temperature in, uh, in the south is better than, higher than the north. And that's why uh, chlorine dioxide was very successful in our experiment here in Qatar two years ago. Also, production of chlorine dioxide must be generated on site. This is also uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, difficult to prepare it, but in general, much better than uh, getting chlorine, chloride, chlorate, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, chloride and uh, hypochlorite. One minute to conclude, please. Here we've got a comparison between chlorine and chlorine dioxide in power and the byproducts. We see the, the, the uh, 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 chlorine and hypochlorite system, the disinfection power rating is medium, while for chlorine dioxide is strong. So chlorine dioxide is definitely is better. Number two, the byproducts of the chloride system of the chlorine, sorry, system hypochlorite is uh, THM. We get always trihalomethane, as I said, chloroform, bromoform, and so on. Also, we have a bromate, the risky uh, uh, a bromate, the dangerous material, and uh, we get chloramine, uh, chlorophenols, uh, and so on. For chlorine dioxide, we get the byproducts uh, is the chloride and the chlorate. And as I said before, we can't control and judge uh, the uh, byproducts of chloride. While it is not easy to control the uh, byproducts and side products of chlorine. Here in Qatar, we have tried the new system, the new uh, uh, chlorine dioxide disinfection system. And we found uh, with the chlorine, at the beginning a few years ago, we have many uh, 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 problems with the bromine. While with the chlorine, uh, with the chlorine dioxide, after uh, applying the chlorine dioxide, is getting always almost nil, below two or nil. Thus, in 2011, most of our readings, it was the bromate is below the, uh, uh, the risky uh, figures. Dr. Khaled, if we can conclude, please, because we lost five minutes at the beginning, so we want so, more. Sorry, sorry. If you can conclu conclude your presentation. So. In a minute. We have some uh, general uh, consideration and conclusions. Number one is chlorine dioxide is almost like a chlorine, but in, in chemistry, it's totally different. It's totally different, uh, uh, the chlorine dioxide. Number two, uh, any disinfectant uh, 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 can has uh, own advantages and disadvantages as a chemical. Number three, the capability of any disinfectant depends on uh, different things, like pathogens pH, temperature, and the water quality we have. Number four uh, is chlorine dioxide is very stable during the time in the distribution. It's very stable comparing to chlorine and other disinfectants. The formation of chloride is very low under the WHO guideline is, as we say, 0.7 milligram per liter. The last one is uh, the chlorate can be minimized adopting a new production te technology. The chloride, we, and the chlorate, we can minimize it uh, during so many procedures. And uh, I show some of the important factors or procedures we can uh, reduce the uh, chloride, the most uh, about 70 to 75 uh, amount of the uh, chlorate. 
Thank you very much for listening, and I appreciate your attendance today. Uh, hopeful to see you again, hopefully. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. I think we already run behind the schedule, so thank you. Uh, we need just uh, two lines of conclusions uh, from each speaker. And I'd like the speakers to come to the stand here so that uh, we have certificates to give to them. Actually, we were supposed to have some questions and answers session, but it's uh, already very late. I don't know whether we're going to have any time for that. We can take, I mean, um, one question to each speaker. First, if you'd like to invite the speakers to the stage, please. The speakers, can you come to the stage, please? Yeah. We have a group this side and a group that side. Another group this side. If you want. We'll allow maybe two or three questions. Yes, Dr. Uh, Abil Majid. Maybe you need to shout. of financial people and top of the technical people. With that, how we can improve on the side, especially that most of the people who can build a plant between 1,000 and 1,500 megawatt and 50 to 100 million gallon, which is a norm in, the, in this uh, area of the region, is uh, the, the, there is no money, very little companies who can build that and keep the people from this area or around the area running this plant. So if we do research and development, I'm sorry to say for the sake of research and development, if we don't take it to the field and implement it like the old days when the desalination started in this region, uh, of course desalination started in uh, early 1919, but MSF RO all was discovered mainly in 50s, 60s, and then 70s was a boom, 80s. Most of those plants either research center on it or a development on it, maintenance, upgrading, and pilot plants. Today, none of those in your hand. And in the last couple of years, we didn't see even a presentation of operation and maintenance experience by the private sector in any conferences. If you look uh, around the world, most of the countries who used to produce desalination masters, PhDs, diploma, either they close down or it's very limited. Why? Because the private sector doesn't care about this. The, the people over there, I know three at least um, areas, international, uh, universities, they have closed down this uh, master or diploma in desalination. So I would like Dr. Adder to tell me how we can solve this. We are only uh, comparing ourselves to United States, Europe, Far East, which they have their own company, and the people prefer to work within the company to work on the, on the plant. But in our real area, we are not doing that. Is it only, sorry to say it in Arabic, taqlid a'ma? Thank you. 
Thank you, Abdul um, Majid. I, first, there are many issues here you raised. Uh, I hope uh, the Gulf countries shift from centralized, larger systems and units to decentralized, smaller, efficient, minimum environmental impact, which are all not strong criteria in selection. They just go for the lowest cost water. But really, to my knowledge, the, the other factors, how many locals are working in the plant or will be working over the life of the plant, or what new technology we expect this company will produce in the next 20 years, nothing of like that. Now, with the moving to solar, the decentralized is important and becomes more feasible and more stable, more sustainable, because relying on more centralized plant, larger, it is dangerous and more risky. When you have many sources that can feed the network, that is part of sustainability and reliability of supply. Now, to come to uh, capacity development and uh, research, there has to be rules pushing the private sector. They have to hire locals, whatever percentage, by the age of the plant. <coughs> and they have to invest some of that income coming from the government or the off-taker to develop new technology. So unless you force or you provide incentive, and both is better, you know, force and incentive. Incentive in the sense of the government saying, if you can prove a pilot to me, I will invest with you in the new technology to build a, a bigger uh, unit size, so the expansion will be in the new technology, not the old technology, which is already 20 years old. Nobody builds. We are still building plants which other people do not build, just because we do not have these rules to get out of business as usual. Allow maybe Dr. Ala, he is very nervous. He looks very nervous. <laughs> He's pointing at his watch. Yes, maybe one or two more questions, but make it very brief, please. Um, this is a question for uh, Dr. Khalid for the chlorine dioxide. Um, my question is, um, am I correct in saying that your precursors for generation of chlorine dioxide initially were hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride in the generators? Hydrochloric acid, yeah, and are sodium, you, are you, sodium chloride. Okay. And um, is that something in the future that um, would be used uh, elect using one precursor, using electrochemical generation of uh, chlorine dioxide for safety purposes of acid storage, etc.? It could be. Why not? Okay. Future will tell. But have, have you seen that type of technology recently um, in this area? And until now, the chlorate and uh, hydrochloric acid is the most well-known uh, uh, procedure they use for preparation of uh, chlorine dioxide. Thank Until you. now. Thank you. Uh, one very, very final a few, uh, even Ali Rida is here and he's, I think he's going to pull his hair now. Uh, yes, over there. Yeah. Make it very brief, please. And I think you're uh, thirsty for coffee now. So. Uh, my question is to Mr. Srikanth. Uh, Srikanth, you talked about uh, solar desalination in municipal level and uh, industrial level. How about uh, the feasibility of solar desalination in standalone systems? So, the feasibility of solar desalination systems in uh, standalone, like in low scale, decentralized systems. Yeah, that's what I was briefing in two applications. One of the application is basically uh, <coughs> integrated with power and uh, water. The other one is standalone applications. When I say the standalone applications mostly can be used in rural applications where you have a low capacity, where you, you don't need, you don't, you don't have a 24 class 7 demand. When we have a 24 class 7 demand with the current technology maturity in both solar and thermal site, probably we may not be able to get a technology which can operate it for 24 class 7 uh, for larger capacity, but it is feasible for uh, uh, small standalone flats. That was my conclusion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I think, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Finally, 
just a couple, one minute to give certificates to, to our speakers. Uh, we'd like to maybe invite them one by one. Mr. Thank you. Mohamed uh, Farouk. So yes. Yes, you can see it. Shrikan, Mohab. Certificates. Mr. Khalid Yahya. Thank you. I think we're short of two more certificates, but we can. Do you have it? Here? No. We'll give you a fake certificate just for the photograph. I think. We should no, we will not forget the chairman. Yani. <laughs> this is well, what speaker, Martin, okay, so you have to Okay, so you have to Okay, just for the photograph. Okay, come over, just for the photograph. Yes. So, Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, an appreciation to our uh, chairman. So one more. Please don't forget the uh, uh, briefings or... Okay. Just a couple of lines of recommendations.